In this video, I will try to give some scientific and technical comments about the talk that uh, the President Vladimir Putin gave in 2018 on March the 1st, where he presented a series of uh, very sophisticated and impressive new Russian weapons. I am French, my name is uh, Jean-Pierre Petit, I was in charge in the 60s, 70s of a project of uh, MHD electrical generators. Here you have a picture of my laboratory. This is uh, what is called a shock tube. A shock tube is a kind of gun that shoots a burst of uh, plasma, high velocity, high temperature, uh, high pressure and this plasma pass through a magnet in D and this produce uh, electrical power during tens of microseconds. Most of my work was devoted to the cancellation of plasma instabilities, but let's be back to the subject of this video. Many people, especially in United States, consider that this set of new weapons presented by Vladimir Putin are a threat for international security. Before, I would like to present some consideration about such phenomenon, what is called a war. What's a war? What does it come from? It comes from geopolitical tensions. Consider two distant places on the Earth where the atmospheric pressure is very different. You can expect that a storm will occur, which is a dissipative process. By analogy, we could consider that the wars form some sort of a dissipative process, recurrent and natural. So that the First World War arose from uh, economical and sociological tensions and it bogged down during years. Most of the terrible damages, human and materials, came on both sides from the heavy artillery. We could ask why a guy like Adolf Hitler succeeded to take his people in a new war only 21 years later. This symbol he said to his people, forget the trench warfare that was horrible. What I suggest now is very different. It's a lighting war. With the new kind of war I have just invented, we'll get fantastic advantages, human advantages and territorial advantages. With few human and material casualties due to our fantastic human and material superiority. This was experimented with much success in Poland, Czechoslovakia and France. The German people was delighted. When he came to Berlin, Hitler was welcomed by the people as a military genius. But later, the things turned out badly in England and Russia, you know the story. When the German towns were bombarded by English and American planes, it was too late to say, oh, I'm sorry, I think that the lighting war was not such a good idea. In 1941, the Japanese implemented the concept of preemptive war, and that was the attack to Pearl Harbor. They attacked the American Navy because they thought the American would attack them soon. So they wanted to prevent that. And the second concept to be implemented was the concept of weapons of mass destruction. This corresponds to the Japanese project called Project 731, settled 
in Manchuria and ruled by the general Ishi. All that stuff was planned and decided 15 years before the Japanese started the war against the United States. The giant submarine E-400 was the brainchild of the Admiral Yamamoto, who was in charge of the Japanese Navy. The E-400 could host three airplanes, Seren, in his hangar and put it in action in 45 minutes using a catapult. On the image, you may also see a crane that was supposed to be used to pick the airplane after the flight and to take it back to the submarine. Here you have a closer view of the door of the hangar when this unit was captured by Americans in 1945. In the available technical notes, we can read that the airplane could be assembled in 45 minutes if we include their two pontoons, but if we don't use it, only 15 minutes would be necessary. On technical sketches, we can see that the airplane was linked to the catapult by an assembly and not by the pontoons. It's obvious that these pontoons were used just for tests. Now imagine a real mission. Submarine goes to the surface close to the coast by night. The parts of the airplane are assembled and then it is catapulted. Who could imagine that this airplane, after this mission ended, could get back to the submarine, be picked and put in the hangar? No kidding, it's impossible. To me, the configuration of the airplane is the following. And after catapulting, the assembly was dropped. As a conclusion, the Seren was a kamikaze airplane, nothing else. Now look at that plane. Could you imagine that with this big submarine and 144 sailors aboard, you cross all the Pacific Ocean to bring close to the coast and even to the eastern coast of the United States an airplane for a no return flight which will bring a 500 pounds bomb? It makes no sense. It's obvious that since the very beginning, since the 30s, this project E-400, conceived both by the Emperor of Japan, Hiro Ito, and by his faithful Admiral Yamamoto, the great hero of Japan, was closely related to the Unit 731 and jam warfare. Yamamoto had ordered the construction of 18 E-400 submarines, which would have carried no less than 54 biological weapons, enough to create disaster over all America. Keep in mind that since the beginning, since the 30s, Yamamoto had designed his brainchild E-400 submarine in order to make it able to do a round trip all around the Earth, so Japan could master the world. You know something? If they didn't use it, it was just because it was not finished in time. They had no steel, they had no material to make the submarines. But if they had it, do you really think they would have hesitated to send these planes over the country of the United States and make millions of deaths? I have just made this parenthesis, this foreword, in order to show to you that uh, the concept of mass destruction weapons and planetary weapons is not new. Now we arrive to the today's situation. You are supposed to know that we have 9,000 nuclear warheads over all the world. If you want to think about the possible consequences, just consider what you can make with depleted uranium weapons. Well, you multiply this by billions 
and you have a very weak idea of the possible consequences. Even with the smallest bomb, just 100 kilotons, is a tenth of Hiroshima bomb. Well, this is good news. Nuclear war is simply impossible. So that we didn't experience a global world war since 700 years due to the well-known balance of terror. In 2011, America suffered a terrible impact in its own territory. It never happened since the American Civil War. So that the President George Bush decided that now America should face threat from any part of the world and from any country. So that in 2002, he decided to pull America out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty that was signed in 1972. It was immediately a deep matter of concern for the Russians. They argued that the extension of the ABM system to NATO's country would completely surround Russia. In addition, they said that the, the ABM system based in space could be used to destroy the satellites. But the American replied immediately, don't be afraid, it's just against Iran, not against you. Remember what Ronald Reagan said at United Stations, all space laser are designed to destroy flying saucer, not Russian satellites. But you know how the Russians are. They are suspicious by nature. You can't deal frankly with them. Well, now, look what was their answer to this situation. What is ballistic missile? It is rocket propellant. The time during the thrust is in action is very short, no more than few minutes. But during that time, the infrared emission is so high that it is immediately detected by satellite. To join two points A and B on the surface of the Earth, there are two possible choices inscribed along a geodesic path. These two paths are inscribed in a plane that contains the center C of the sphere. The tracks of such path correspond to what we call a grid circle of the sphere. For example, the equator is a grid circle. Until now, the path to the target corresponded to the shortest one. It corresponds to the green curve and the maximum altitude is around 800 miles. The trajectory is parabolic and corresponds to a minimum expense of solitude. The trajectory of a ballistic missile from Russia to the United States passes over the North Pole. The range of Russian ballistic missile was close to 7,000 miles. For this reason, the American ground-based anti-ballistic missile was located mainly in the northern part of the continent. In the first step, the Russian decided to use a second trajectory, which is much longer, and pass over the South Pole, so that all American anti-ballistic missiles located in the northern part of the country becomes inefficient. Then the trajectory becomes a circle. The density of the atmosphere becomes negligible above 50 miles, so that it's possible to have a ballistic pass at an altitude of 60 miles. On another hand, the detection by the warning radar net comes later. Of course, it requires a larger velocity and a larger amount of propellant, so the rocket will be heavier. It corresponds to the Russian missile Sarmat, which weights 200 tons. It has a 10 tons payload, which can be composed of 10 heavy warheads weighting each one ton. Another formula, this 10 tons payload 
can be composed of warheads plus system designed to defeat anti-ballistic system. These missiles can also be equipped with 24 hypersonic gliders avant-guard. Sarmat will uh, be equipped with the hypersonic high-yield systems uh, with capabilities for beating missile uh, defense systems. This new system can be used under any conditions. Now Putin presents an infinite range cruise missile powered by nuclear energy. It's not at the end. We've developed the new strategic weapons that don't use ballistic trajectory at all, which means that missile defense will be useless against it. This is what I'm going to tell you about now. This new kind of weapon, promising weapon systems that Russia has developed using new, unique technology designed by our engineers. One of such systems is a small, super powerful nuclear energy system that can be deployed in a cruise missile like uh, X-101, a Russian missile or US-made Tomahawk missile. Yet there is basically no limit to its range. It's a small missile with an unlimited range and unpredictable trajectory that can avoid all intercept barriers, cannot be intercepted by existing or future missile defense systems. Uh, late in 2017, at the central testing ground of the Russian Federation, we had a successful test launch of this newest cruise missile with the nuclear uh, power energy unit. Uh, and it achieved a uh, proper altitude. Uh, so now, after the successful test, we can start manufacturing this new kind of weapon, a strategic nuclear weapon system with a missile carrying a nuclear power energy unit. Let's now watch this video. This is uh, how it avoids defense barriers. It has unlimited range, so it can keep going like this forever, maneuvering. As you understand, this is unheard of, and nobody else has such a system in the world. They may uh, create something similar in the future, but by that time, our guys will come up with new ideas as well. What can we say about this Russian cruise missile propelled by nuclear energy? Is it subsonic or supersonic? Let's go back to the American tokamak as the typical cruise missile with 1,500 miles range. It's basically subsonic. It could not be supersonic because it would require too much fuel. Some countries have a supersonic cruise missile, mainly the Russian, but their range is reduced by a factor of five. Twenty years ago, the Russian equipped a submarine like the Kursk with a lot of granite supersonic missile. You can see how the wings and the tail plane were folded before to be put in a tube. Such missiles were 
designed to attack aircraft carriers, but their range was limited to 300 miles. Let's go back to the declaration of the President Putin. I think that uh, the Russian missile is uh, supersonic. In effect, why do you limit the velocity if you have as much energy as you want from your nuclear reactor? This idea is not new. It was developed by the American between 1955 to 1961. It corresponds to the project Pluto. Pluto is a slam. A supersonic low altitude missile. Now let us see how does it work. It's very simple. It's similar to a stator reactor. Instead of heating the air by the heat produced by the combustion of the fuel, it is heated when it passes through the core of a nuclear reactor. At the inlet, the air arrives at atmospheric pressure at Mach 3.6. It is compressed to 21 bars and heated at 500 degrees centigrade through the shock wave. In the reactor, the temperature grows to 1200 degrees. Then this hot air is ejected through a nozzle and accelerated and this produces a net thrust. Let's have a look inside Pluto. We find a large place for avionics. Remember, we are at the end of the 50. The aboard computer worked with lamps. And we have a large place for the weapons bay. Pluto was supposed to cross over a very large territory and to drop two megatons bombs on cities, industrial centers. It was 26 meters long and weighted 26 tons. After the Second World War, the Americans thought about putting a nuclear reactor aboard an airplane in order to make it fly. The airplane had grown a lot. On the left, you have the B-29 that dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. And on the right, the B-36 Peacemaker with six motors. A nuclear reactor could provide a tremendous amount of energy, but the problem was the weight, how to protect the crew from the radiation, neutron flux and gamma flux. But when we deal with unmanned aircraft, with nobody aboard, all those problems disappear. Before a nuclear reactor would be activated, it emits almost no radiation. Before activation, the neutron emission may be inhibited by absorbing bars of cadmium, the Pluto cross missile, weighting 26 tons, was ground-based. In this new cruise missile presented by Putin in March, the nuclear reactor should be as small as a football balloon. With such small size, uh, five and a half meter, it could be operated from an airplane, ground-based or from a ship. Now, let's think what it could look like. Here is a Russian missile before launching. It is equipped with a cap and a booster. The reactor is not active because the cadmium bar in the yellow are still in place. They absorb neutrons and prevents the fission to develop. Immediately after launching, the cap is removed and the booster is fired. At the same time, the cadmium bars are removed. The fission chain reaction can start. The reactor becomes active. Rapidly, due to the booster's action, the missile gets its cruise velocity about Mach 3.6 through the front conical shock wave, the air is heated to 500 degrees centigrade, and then it 
crosses the core of the reactor whose temperature is 1200 degrees centigrade. It is heated and expanded in the nozzle to get the thrust. In the reactor of the proto missile, the elements were assembled that way, one against the other. There were small airflow channels made of ceramic, beryllium oxide, uranium oxide, and zirconium oxide. The air could flow in and be heated. On this picture, you can see such elements. They are gathered together to form hexagonal elements composed by 38 tubes. We have no picture of the full-size Tory reactor. This corresponds to a smaller model where the system was tested. This is a schema of the full-size Tory reactor. You recognize the hexagonal elements and you have a shield to protect the guidance system from gamma rays. And you can see on the left the cadmium bars. What was the full size of the mortar? The technical note says uh, diameter one meter, length one meter, a cubic meter volume. This is now a picture of the Tory reactor, full size. The inlet is on the left. At the inlet, some preheated air was injected at 500 degrees centigrade and compressed at 21 bars in order to simulate the flight condition. The test time was limited by the available compressed air. This test time was extended up to 300 seconds for the 600 megawatt nuclear generator cooled by air, so that one considered that the motor of the missile Pluto was operational. In 1957, the Pluto program was a quite serious project, but it was also the International Geophysical Year, and uh, there was a strong phenomenon that changed the landscape. At this time, the United States used their vanguard rocket to study the high atmosphere. But in Russia, the rocket Semyorka R7 was already operational. As a conclusion, I would say that what President Putin said is really true. The Russian own a long range supersonic missile propelled by nuclear energy. They have just been inspired by a project developed by the American half a century ago. Well, let's go back to the talk of Putin. What else? We have uh, unmanned submarines that move at the uh, ultra-deep levels intercontinentally with a speed that is much, much higher than the speed of uh, modern submarines, torpedoes, and even the fastest surface ships. This is just fantastic. Uh, these uh, vehicles are noiseless and uh, there is no defense system in the world today that can cope with such uh, subsurface vehicles. They can be equipped with conventional or nuclear weapons uh, attacking coastal defenses and infrastructure facilities. In December 2017, we've completed testing this new innovative nuclear propulsion system for this unmanned subsurface vehicle. It's extremely small, and at the same time, uh, it's, uh, has its size is 100 times less than a regular submarine, and at the same time, it's more powerful. Well, let's summarize what Putin says about his fantastic 
underwater drawn. One, it goes very deep. Two, it cruises at very fast velocity. Three, it is 100 times smaller than a modern submarine, while it is more powerful. But four, it is silent. No kidding. All that together? How is it possible? Something is absolutely sure. If this submarine missile would correspond to the video given by Putin, when you see this uh, small submarine drone with its poor four propellers, and if it goes so fast, it will not be silent enough. So it seems to me that there are only two possibilities. Either Putin lies, either he does not. And if he doesn't, how does it work? If you want to move an object into water, the problem is a drag, is a friction. Water is a thousand times denser than air. During the last World War, the speed of the torpedo was around 40 knots, 70 kilometers. They could hit a target at a distance of one or two kilometers. The average travel time was around one minute or more. Modern torpedoes with classical propeller system don't go much faster. Their range has been increased up to 50 kilometers. With a self-guidance system and a velocity around 50 knots, for shorter distances this can be extended to 60, 70 knots, 100 kilometers per second, 120, no more. In 1977, the Russians deployed a rocket-propelled Schwal torpedo with a speed of 200 knots, possibly extended to 300 knots. The idea was to make the torpedo to cruise in vapor instead of water in order to reduce drastically the drag. This torpedo is a wire guided. You can see the four wires coming from the arms deployed just after the launch. The torpedo is surrounded by a cloud made of mixture of gas and vaporized water. The hot gas produced by a small rocket is ejected at the front part of the torpedo through that hole. You see how the direction of the injection can be modified by two roads, which gives the torpedo a high maneuverability. I explained all that in my website 12 years ago. Well, it goes faster, in fact, but the Schwal torpedoes are terribly noisy. It doesn't correspond to the talk of Vladimir Putin. So, back to this fantastic weapon presented by President Putin. The question remains, how does it work? You probably remember the movie The Hunt for Red October based on the 1984 novel of Tom Clancy with Sean Connery. In that movie, the Red October is supposed to be a Russian submarine, fast and stealth. The secret can be found, for example, in the patent of Stewart Way, 1966. For any object moving in a fluid, the drag due to frictions comes from what is called the boundary layer. In this relatively thin layer, the velocity of the fluid with respect to the object tends to zero at the wall. There is a transfer of negative momentum to the wall, and the result is a tangential force, a drag. Now we introduce a force field acting on the boundary layer due to electromagnetic force. 
if this force field produces a constant velocity profile, there is no gradient, there is no momentum transfer, no tangential force, the drag is annihilated. Now, if the force field becomes stronger, we accelerate the fluid action reaction principle, we get a negative drag, the body is accelerated. So, to reach high velocity, it is just necessary to move the fluid in the thin layer surrounding the submarine or an airplane. We'll see that further. Now, let's go back to the patent of the American Stewart Way, the wall accelerator. In yellow, a wire that produces the magnetic field. See figure A. In figure C, corresponding magnetic pattern. We see that it is periodic. From a cell to the next cell, the direction of the field is reversed. In the places indicated in the red, you notice the enhancement of the field. Its intensity is doubled with respect to the field that will be created by a single wire. On another hand, notice that the field turns rapidly to zero out of the plane, at a distance equivalent to the distance between two wires, its value becomes almost negligible. So that this configuration concentrates the magnetic field and the magnetic energy close to the wall. On figure A, green, a set of linear electrodes. Here again, you see that the polarity of the electrodes is alternated. On figure D, low right, you will see that from a cell to the next, both the magnetic field direction and the current density direction are periodically reversed. So that the electromagnetic force G cross B, see the fingers rule on the left, forms a set of vectors parallel to the wall. See on the right the red arrows, all oriented in the same direction. In addition, in his pattern in 1966, Stewart Webb precise that the wire should be made of supraconducting material embedded in liquid helium. See figure B. What happened in the 60s when Stewart Webb presented his 3 meters long model in Santa Barbara? Some preliminary remarks. In the submarine of Stewart Way, there is only a portion of the hull which is active. The rest of the hull is passive and induces a drag. It seems that Way did not integrate the two functions combining propulsion and drag cancellation. In addition, a submarine has a tail unit. It is no longer necessary. A mesh day submarine can have a high maneuverability just modifying the strength of the Lawrence force on sides. So let's remove the tail fin and the ailerons. However, Stewart Way would have given a better efficiency to his MHD submarine if the wall hull would have been covered by his wall accelerator system. Anyway, let's go back to his formula. The magnetic field was produced by a battery and the B value was around 150 Gauss, a hundredth of a Tesla. The velocity was 40 centimeters per second. 
The Lorentz force is proportional to the B field and to the current density J. This loss is limited to one ampere per square centimeter in order to avoid electrolysis of the water. The electrode conductivity of the seawater is poor, so there is a strong dissipation by Joule effect. The efficiency is a ratio between the power devoted to propulsion divided by the total power, including Joule effect. For the model of Stewart Way, the efficiency was around one millionth. Very weak. In 1992, the Japanese built a MSD boat called Yamato One. It was propelled by Faraday MSD thrusters. So the drag of the hull was still present. They used a supraconducting field for Tesla. The total electrical intensity was 2000 amperes. Then they reached a velocity of 8 knots with a thrust of 1 ton. MHD propulsion in seawater can be compared to the propulsion with an all-board. The intensity is the number of turns of the propeller and the magnetic field corresponds to the pitch of the blade. If the magnetic field is too weak, it's equivalent to try to propel the boat. The motor coupled to a propeller was blade have a very small pitch angle, so you don't move so much and you eat the water of the lake. Similarly, the Yamato one heated the seawater. If we look at the precedent formula, we easily can compute that there is a threshold with limited current density. It corresponds to a magnetic field around 10 Tesla. During the 90s, at the Francis Bitter Magnet Laboratory, some experience of marine propulsion were achieved with the 8 Tesla field. Chinese and Japanese have projects with 15 Tesla fields. France, as usual, has chosen a careful watching and waiting position. To sum up, I would say that President Putin tells the truth. On scientific and technical ground, it is perfectly possible to build an unmanned submarine propelled by nuclear energy. Before activation, the nuclear reactor, as usual, emits no radiation. If it is a submarine missile, it is not necessary to put a shield against radiation. So the craft will be relatively small and compact. Since the 70s, we know that MHG propulsion creates no turbulence and is perfectly noiseless. Notice that the magnetic field is strong only in a thin boundary layer and negligible outside, so that magnetic detection doesn't work. A system of MHD wall accelerator will give it a high maneuverability and very high speed, probably much higher than the speed of the torpedo Jval. I think such craft could cruise at uh, several thousand kilometers per hour. A submarine can carry a very heavy warhead. So I would say that such unmanned submarine could carry a heavy nuclear weapons sizing several hundreds megatons, able to create a several hundred meters high tsunami that could destroy New York or San Francisco. Well, this is horrible, but 
nuclear weapons must be horrible. It's the key of the deterrence. As a conclusion, it seems that again the Russians have developed a work initially done by American half a century ago. All that supports President Putin's claims. Anyway, nuclear energy is not the only way to produce tremendous amounts of electrical energy. The Russians have shown that uh, the energy provided by a rocket could be converted into electrical energy using a pulsed MHD uh, generator with self-excitation. Air in action in Siberia for geophysical purpose. A MHD accelerator is also a MHD generator. Such machines are reversible. So you can perfectly transform the nozzle of a rocket propelled torpedo into an electrical generator and use this electricity to cancel the drag. Just add cesium to the powder in order to rise the conductivity and admit that the temperature in the nozzle could be very high. 3000 degrees centigrade to get good electrical conductivity. Of course, your nozzle will have a very short lifetime, but uh, torpedoes are not designed to have a long life. A such subject is rather classified. Well, we arrive at the end of this first part of this video devoted to the new Russian weapons. In the next, I will talk about uh, flying missile, hypersonic, my 1020. Okay, bye bye.